Welcome to Resilient Love Podcast. Join hosts Quentin and Brianna as they discuss tips on love, life, and business. Let's get into this next episode. Everybody, we're back with another episode of Resilient mm-hmm. Love, and we have a awesome special guest with us, Dr. Tyner, and we are just so excited to for her to share all the great things she's doing with social justice, social change, and leadership. So, Doctor, would you go ahead and take the floor and share more with with our listeners? Yes. First, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you today. For me, as we talk about those leadership topics, social change, we're talking about right now. But in order to get to right now, I have to tell you a little bit about my history and why I decided to become an attorney, why I decided to become a civil rights professor and how this all started. It all started in my hometown, Rondo. And Rondo is not unique. It's a historically black community in the heart of our capital city in Minnesota, St. Paul. And why I say it's not unique, our story is a story of over a thousand communities across the nation of having the challenge of building and creating and having that Black Wall Street experience. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, just like Tulsa and the Greenwood District, we also had the challenge of the freeway and highway system of a highway going right through the center of our hometown. That meant that people overnight lost intergenerational wealth because we were displaced and our homes were taken from us. It meant that we lost at our peak, we had hundreds of businesses. We only have about a couple dozen black owned businesses today in our district. So I would say what inspired me on leadership and social change is my own family story. Five generations of our family have lived and worked and played in this district that we call Rondo, our hometown. But really what it means is that that it compelled me to find a way to speak up and stand up for the rights of the people. And the way that I found that platform, that way to engage, is by becoming an attorney and through my writings. Wow. And um, we got a sneak peek of the book right behind her, but we're, we're not going to jump into that right now. So let's get into this next thing, Quentin. As a professor and a lawyer, you know the power of being educated on laws of the land and rights as a citizen. Share how your book has been a response to the call of enriching young people to change. Well, as you hear from my Rondo story, I learned very early on by one of our local community organizers, got voice, got power. So I wanted to encourage young people to understand that they could use their voice, that they didn't have to listen to those stories that say you're too young to make a difference, or you don't have a title or enough education, that truly if they had a vision, a vision for the future, which we all need more of, or what a more just, an inclusive and free world would really look like, that they could get started. They could start where they were. And it also reminded young people that that's the story of America, that young people, those are young people that were the foot soldiers of the civil rights movement, that Mm -hmm. put their bodies in front of violence and those water hoses. We saw the pictures. And here we are fast forwarding to today, we have young people like the Dream Defenders who stood up against stand your ground laws. We have young people who are currently even protesting in the streets around unjust laws. So young people have always been at the forefront of social change movements to raise the moral and social conscience of our nation. So when we think about my book and why I decided to think about young people and social change, I wanted to give them that encouragement to say you're never too young to make a difference. And we need your voice. And if you got that voice, you've got power. How will you use it? Oh, got voice, got power. And so does Dr. Tyner. Good Lord, I felt it. I felt it right here. I felt like I was in your class. I hope I was class. Um, so when you think about that, literacy is the focus. And I love how you turn your great passion into a book. So can you speak about how that campaign, Leaders Are Readers. That was very profound when I read that. Yes, leaders and readers are about our young people. And I'll make it personal again. All my work is rooted to my own personal lived experience. Mm -hmm. We launched Leaders Are Readers because of a circumstance with far too many of my clients in prison, that many of them learn how to read while in prison. Depending on which research study you're looking at, 60 to 80% of those who are incarcerated in adult facilities are functionally illiterate. 85% 
in the juvenile justice system. So it really was a call to action that we wanted young people to help bridge and help support and bridge that literacy gap because we know reading is the building block. So if we could help to create more opportunities for literacy, of course I have my own agenda. When one in four children are reading at grade level, if you're not reading at grade level by fourth grade, you're four times more likely to drop out of school. Mm. Couple with that, if you dropped out of school, you're three and a half times more likely to be arrested in your lifetime. I should no longer be able to say those statistics like a nursery rhyme. I should be able to say four and four children are reaching their dreams, living out their full potential. That's what we were after. And we knew mass incarceration. I grew up during the peak of the war on drugs. We know that it impacted our families. We know that our moms and our dads, aunts, uncles, brothers, and sisters entered in those prison gates, returned back home after those mandatory minimums, 10 years and up, mm -hmm. back home with that permanent scarlet letter that read F for felon. We know that we need to turn things around. We can't afford to lose another generation in this tangled web of mass incarceration. So Leaders Are Readers was about making sure that our babies could read. Because if we know that there's a correlation between illiteracy and future incarceration, why would we not take the data and the information and do something with it right away? Why would we not take the data and information instead of creating a pathway to the criminal justice system, create a pathway to success for all children? So we decided to take action. Once we knew if we could get the babies to read, then they would naturally emerge as those leaders. They'd have the information and knowledge and guess what? They'd be unstoppable. Yeah. Yeah, and with that book, it definitely infiltrates that school to prison pipeline because mm -hmm. we have to make that connection and, and understand that that's a real thing. They're using the same data from testing. They're using the same data from attendance, lack of, to really develop this almost uh, avatar of what your future is going to look like. But you have been a part of that change, and I just want to give you kudos yes. from North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we're just getting started on that freedom journey. You know, we're, yeah. we're not turning back. Uh, the former, um, the first vice president, or I mean, the first prime minister of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, mm -hmm. he said that we go forwards ever, backwards never. So this freedom train is not turning back around. We're just joining in with voices like yours and we're continuing this work. So Kwame Nkrumah gave us that message, forwards ever, backwards never. Yes, I received that and that was good. We're already in power. Already. <laughs> there we go. So uh, the next question, um, definitely very dear to me, and I see it all the time. So I just I want to know, planning people, growing justice, let's chat on how effectively plant, plant seeds to grow productive communities. And I mean it's, by oftentimes mm -hmm. um, we find ourselves just planning and planning and planning, but the effective part kind of just... Mm -hmm. We plant it, but we're not planting. We got to put the P. We got to put the T up there. We plant a lot. But where the T at? <laughs> that's Dr. T right here. So, go ahead and check. I think that's a, a perfect piece because oftentimes most people want the results, but you know, to reap a harvest, we have to prepare the ground. We mm -hmm. have to till it. We have to make sure we fertilize it. We have to plant the seeds in, in good ground on that good soil. So when we think about that, sometimes it's easy. We want a microwave revolution. We want a microwave process of social change. But based upon my cultural tradition, faith tradition, I realize that I'm indebted seven generations out. So when I make a move, I'm thinking about who does this impact for generations I won't even live to see. And so that holds me accountable. So I'm not just planning something. I'm planting those trees. And that's why we have that metaphor of that banyan tree to represent us, that we're planting those trees that other generations will take shade under, take refuge under. But when we plant a tree, the banyan tree is very unique. No other tree is like it in the world. It grows new roots from its branches. So it means that we're interconnected. So we have to understand our shared humanity. No one's greater than the other. No one's humanity is diminished. And we also have to then think about our common destiny. So when we're planting, we're planting not just for ourselves, but for the future of our society. So oftentimes my students go, okay, that sounds good, Dr. Tyner, but what do we do? It means that we're spending, I tell them we have a 90-10 rule. We spend 90% of our time preparing, tilling that ground, getting it ready. And the 10% is when we see that window of opportunity. So I do a lot of policy work on shifting whole systems. 
there will be policies that will be changed and no one will ever know my name. That's the greatest blessing. But that seven generations out will be the direct beneficiaries. Ooh. So when we think about that, I want us to think about those solutions that are sustainable. I want us to think about those solutions that radically transform our local economies, for instance. Don't tell me again that there's a black wealth gap between blacks and whites that will take 228 years to, to help bridge. 228 years out, you'll tell me it'll take 528 years. Let's do it right now. And let's right. do it right now by addressing some concrete things. So everyone's, we don't know what to do. We know what to do. Choosing not to do it is a different proposition. We know what to do. And so when we know what to do and we know the recipe for success, why don't we put the ingredients together and do something that benefits us all in some meaningful ways? And it will take time. Like for me, bacon, my mother's palm cake, I don't have it yet. Maybe I don't sift the flour long enough and she's got that magical touch. Mm -hmm. But with preparation, keep working at it. Keep getting that mentorship from our elders. Mm -hmm. We can mix this cake of justice up and we can make an impact for the long run. So yes, there is a distinction. Most people are planning, but they're not planting. They're not looking back to the next generation to cultivate their leadership. In the workplace alone, there are five generations in the workplace. Ooh. If you're looking at anything in the news right now, there's probably seven generations outside protesting on the streets. How do you wow. reach each generation? Yeah. What can they learn from each other? Are their demands different? Do they have different interests? What does it look like? And I think until we start planting, planting requires time. It requires nurturing a process. And it requires us to be attentive. What I'm growing in Minnesota is not what you're going to grow in North Carolina. Oh, yeah. So we have to be intentional on in what we're doing. So now is the time we no longer can afford to say that change will come, as Dr. King talked about on those wills of inevitability. We have to take the research, the data, the information and knowledge. I want to hear from all seven of those generations all on the street. Mm -hmm. All their voices matter. And I want to hear what they believe is the future around justice. And I wanna work with each of those generations to make it come alive. Man, that, you, you, you got me, you got me. Um, when you have my attention, you have my attention. <laughs> and, and it's so profound. I, I told Brianna once that a lot of times I go back and I listen to MLK speeches. I go back and I listen to Malcolm X. I go and listen and try to figure out what is the message in between there's always a map that that was there. We just got to figure out what's the missing pieces mm -hmm. and where are we in that map? You know, it's funny that he mentions the word map because we just played a game, Escape Room. And, you know, in Escape Room, there are clues hidden in that, not necessarily hidden, but they're in plain sight. Yet you have to have the mindset to want to actually strategically find those clues to get out of that block or that space. And I feel as though, as he mentioned, those former leaders and now present leaders are leaving us the clues to get out of the, the true escape room, how to escape that systematic oppression, that systematic thing of trying to hold us back when the time is now. So I just, I appreciate that point right there. Um, so taking that to the next level, and you really kind of hit on it, but just to go a little deeper, in your professional opinion, how can we bring social change with the recent media focused on law versus life? Yes, I, I think that's going back to that map. Whether <laughs> it was Malcolm X, Dr. King, or I mentioned Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the first prime minister of Ghana, they all gave us a bit of a map to follow. I think we've forgotten some of those early precepts, that idea of what we needed to know versus what we're seeing, processing and always having a game plan, right? We're talking about maps and plans. So I think, first of all, we have to make a distinction because most people, when they think of the word law, it equates to justice. Ooh, right. There right. are other components. I've been a lawyer long enough. Before I was a lawyer, I was a community member and the law always had power over our community. It didn't necessarily mean that we had justice. It wasn't always clear who was the victim. It wasn't always clear who was the offender. So when you think about that, I think we first have to challenge ourselves and say, what are our own perceptions around law versus justice? When Dr. King was talking about justice 
It wasn't just a word on a piece of paper. It wasn't just a building, a court building. He was talking about a moral component of justice. He was talking about that Micah 6, 8 of seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before God. He was giving very specific direction mm -hmm. that gave a moral good around justice about being your brother's or sister's keeper. You're not necessarily gonna get that written in a policy or a procedure or a regulation. So he was taking us to a different map. He was taking us to a, a moral plateau of asking us some critical questions. And even he left us with that map you are talking about, his last book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? He left us with a blueprint on next steps. And so when we think about all of those pieces, I think we have to be careful with words. Does law equal justice? Does justice equal accountability? And then for this other piece versus life, I think we have to define within our laws, human rights laws do this for us, but we need to bring this directly into the context of our local laws and our local communities. What does life mean? What does sanctity of life look like? So a part of the change in our policies, even here in Minnesota, I served on the working group that was uh, working directly on reducing police deadly encounters. And we spent an extensive length of time with a hard press from the community to make sure that all of our language put at the forefront sanctity of life. And you might think that sounds obvious. Well, yes, it might, of course it does. That's our human existence. But remember, there's a difference between law, justice, accountability, and how we define sanctity of life. So how do we, to a certain extent, I'm just putting it out there, how do we bring all those components together that respond to the needs of people in some meaningful ways. So when I watch the news or hear the news updates, you're not telling me about something that happened in North Carolina. You're not telling me about something that happened here in Minneapolis. You're telling me about my brother and sister. Yeah. That looks remarkably different. And until we start changing and thinking about what these words mean, I think we'll have a challenge in giving definition because we won't have clarity of that plan and that map of purpose. For me as an attorney, I'm focusing on sanctity of life because I became an attorney to protect my brother's life, literally. I became an attorney literally to protect my mother's health care rights. I became an attorney to protect my sister, who everyone said, okay, you know, just continue on your path. But I wanted to make sure her rights were respected in the workplace. So I, this has to be more tangible than just words. So this is an excellent question. What do those words mean? And how do we create the laws and policies to protect the most important thing that we all have? Money can't replace it. Yeah. Nothing can replace a life. Wow. I love that. Rewording, rewording the policy because the policy has more purpose when we actually put in place the right context. And in this case, the context is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what they said. But we have to really do that. That's what they say. <laughs> okay. Right. So, you know, on a serious note, through all the experiences and challenges, because I'm sure there's some things that you have not shared on this platform. So I'm thinking about everything. There you go. Dr. Artika. <laughs> what, how has that made you more resilient? I think it made me resilient in the sense of reminding myself that we come this far by faith. Mm -hmm. I've had the honor and privilege of tracing back our roots as African-Americans. So hence why I kept bringing up Dr. Kwame Nkrumah because I spent a significant amount of time in Ghana. And if you're going to talk about the map, as you earlier talked about that blueprint, mm -hmm. piece of what both Dr. King and Malcolm X went to find are our roots. How do you think they could remain resilient and courageous in the midst of imminent death and threats on their life day by day by day? They went and found their roots. Both of them ended up going to Ghana. Dr. Maya Angelou was there as well. Why? Because there's something to be said when you go into that slave castle and you see the reality of what our ancestors made it through. We'd have to be the strongest people on the planet. You go through the women's chamber. That women's chamber shouldn't have held 20 people and you had hundreds of women in there and you have them oftentimes we don't talk about the condition as you're driving up to the slave castle in Elmina you could smell it 
You can smell still the despair today, the bodily fluids. You can still smell it as you're driving up. You can feel it. All your senses are awake. You don't know whether to cry, scream, or vomit all at once. So when I think about what's rooted me in my resiliency, knowing who I am, there's nothing anyone can tell me. And folks go, well, what, you're not willing to learn? No, that's not what I'm saying. There's nothing you can tell me about who I am and what I cannot accomplish because my ancestors already paid the debt. They paid the debt as they cried out for freedom and for justice, as they fought for freedom and justice. We don't even talk about that. That many of our ancestors joined in the Union Army to fight to make sure the Civil War was won. And then they didn't get to even rest after that. Still fighting, still yet today, four centuries of oppression, four centuries of discrimination by law, by policy, and we're still here. So I can't think of a greater resiliency story as I walk through those slave castles. I know day by day, I'm taking you know, Dr. Maya Angelou's poem with me, grandmothers. She gives us that notion that I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. When I walk in a room, I walk with an army and we get work done. And you're like, but you just came by yourself. Are you seeing things? No, my ancestors carried me through the womb. They carried me here and they'll carry me on to eternity. And they're saying, when no one else is saying, go forward, they're saying, press on. When no one else says I'm doing the right thing, they're saying, march forward. When others say you should give up, you should quit, they're saying, we got one more day ahead. We taste freedom. Yes, powerful. Mm -hmm. That's a great reminder. Great reminder. Wow. Yeah. He's, he's just speechless right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes me, I, I noticed that you just, you reinforced a lot of things and a lot of thinking and to hold a certain level of accountability, even to myself, to really push the more to dig into being effective in the community, uh, being that go-to person, being able to, we often have the Narr the narrative is painted in the African-American community that we cannot work together. That's mm -hmm. not true. Mm -hmm. It's not true. So you have really reaffirmed that we are powerful, we are resilient, and we can do this, and we will. Mm -hmm. um, one more thing about your book, the curriculum, is it only in Minnesota or is it available in other states? Oh, we took Justice Makes a Difference, Amazing Africa A to Z. We've taken it to the world. Okay. You could just go to our website, um, Planting People, Growing Justice. So it's ppgjli.org on YouTube. You can see all the videos we're creating in production now. So people don't have to just go, is Dr. Tyner telling the truth? What's her experience in Ghana? I'm creating a film now so you can go with me. Because so many people, they don't have a relationship to understand home. So how can they understand where they're headed? Mm -hmm. So in order to understand their narrative, the beginning, home. Home's not just a physical space. I was born here in Ramsey County. I understand that. But the home, my ancestral home is something different. And that's where I find strength and power. When I'm sitting there with our king, king our king of Aquamu, I'm mm -hmm. getting some, some wisdom. Mm -hmm. I'm learning about my culture. I'm learning about where we come from. And I just, you know, I'm like, King Okoto, third, slow down so I can finish taking my notes. But he's pouring out that wisdom. And he reminds us, he says, oh, do you know who you are? He says, remember, we're the conquerors of all conquerors. I was like, now that's a message of resiliency if I've never heard one before. They don't tell our story. Now, yeah. we always think that slavery is despair and, and just all oh, everything was given up. The Aquamus fought against slavery wherever they were in the world. In fact, the Christenborg Castle in Ghana, they overtook it from the Danes. They're not going to tell us that part of our history. They were like, no chains to hold us, Bob. Wherever they were taken around the world, they fought and resisted slavery. No one tells that story. So it's a part of our duty to know who we are. We weren't complacent in slavery. And we don't even understand the narratives of slavery. That's a whole nother lecture. But they've given us a narrative that's inconsistent with what really happened. And now we're at war of trying to figure out who has the best narrative. Go back to the University of Ghana. Talk to Dr. Ob Obadeli. Talk to Dr. Yetsu, And you will understand the history. But isn't it rather ironic that those are the voices you'll never hear? And they have the documents to show us about how slavery really happened, who was impacted. And those victory stories as well, that our African brothers and sisters, our Ghanaian brothers and sisters stood up 
and they fought against slavery. No one tells us that story because we're supposed to be weak, confused, and then it leads to that narrative that you just said, that we can't come together. How did they come together? They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have TikTok. Right. Their brought them together. So I encourage everyone to make sure we know our stories and make sure you measure us right. And when I see myself, I don't see any defeat. I don't even see an ounce of it. I would dare defeat to come towards me because the courage and the work that we all have to do by God's grace, everything we need, we already have. And that's the leadership message that I give. It's not about someone telling you you're a leader or someone giving you a title or saying that you can be impactful. When I look in the mirror, I'm like, go girl. Yes. <laughs> I tell myself. Yes, I'm going to tell you too. Go girl. This was good. <laughs> <laughs> this is good um thank you so much for sharing such vital information with us and our listeners um please share where people can follow and any final remarks that you may have you can follow me by my name artika tyner so a-r-t-i-k-a-t-y-n-e-r.com takes you right to my website all our social media resources that are there the blogs are there and if you're thinking about it which i hope you are by now traveling to ghana which you both have an open invitation to come with me as well you can go to the ghana tab there see the visuals get a different sense to see the beauty of mama africa in a real way so for me i think the words that i would leave us all with is unveil the leader within the world's waiting the world's waiting you don't have to worry about if your impact will be big or small we don't measure that we measure it by whether or not you activated your faith and believed you could make a difference and you started planting those seeds. So leadership, this is an invitation to you all. Join in, stand up, speak up for what's right. Wow. And with that being said, we got to close out. This has been another episode of Resilient, Resilient Love. Love. Thank you. you. Thank you to all listeners and subscribers. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Leave us a five-star review on Apple so that we can continue sharing resilient love. Thanks for listening.